I'm Deepak Chopra. You're watching New Realities. My name is Alan Steinfeld, and my program is called New Realities. Each week, I go deep into the understanding of how we can start to change the planet, how new ideas can be presented to the world to unfold a greater civilization. Topic. This is the topic of the day. This is something that's inputting some new realities into this whole expo, into this whole world. And you know, technology is always a two-edged sword, starting from fire. It could warm you up or burn your own little hut down. And um, every time there's a new technology input into society, we have to make adjustments. And you know what Plato said about writing when it first became institutionalized in Greece, he was weary of it. He said, when you start to write, you forget the memory of the things. He said, we've discovered not a recipe for memory, but a reminder of what memory could be. So writing took away from this consciousness awareness that you just have, just the gnosis. So that's just a kind of foray into the history of how new inventions have not been immediately integrated into the world culture. So we have an incredible panel today. My name is Alan Steinfeld. Look at the making contact. <laughs> Thank you. It's my honor to be here on this panel because I think this is really history. Yeah, people have been talking about UFOs for hundreds of years and it's great, my favorite subject, and they've been talking about spirituality for eons. I don't know if we'll get that right, but it's happening. But this conversation is really new, and that's why I think it's here at the Expo, because somehow the future is here. We're going to have to deal with it one way or another. But let me do introduce everyone on the panel, because um, they all have their own unique point of view. So I'll just go around and introduce, and then I'll throw out a question, and um, we'll get everyone's feedback. So at the end right there is Aquarius Maximus. She is the author of AI Explained, the Melodated IA Probe. And she's a technologist, she's an engineer, she's really into this subject, and we're going to have an incredible point of view from your perspective. Thank you, Aquarius, for being here. Yes. Matthew James Bailey, he's been texting me every day about this panel. Okay, say this, say this. this and, and I know he is so into it, especially the AI ethics. And if you saw the movie 2001, that was a first warning of AI ethics. How don't disconnect me, right? It's like, so where are we today? We're not much further along, according to some people. And thank you for being here, Matthew. And then we have my good friend, Adam Curry, physicist, scientist, um, a real cutting edge thinker, and he's doing experiments with AI. He has a whole thing, maybe you'll talk about that, how to test if AI is consciousness and capable of consciousness. So thanks so much for being here. <laughs> and new to the panel, new to the expo, aren't you? Billy Hood, he's a, he kind of looks at AI, I think, from the ancient point of view, from an ancient spiritual point of view, and where it fits into today's culture and how it's either evolving us or not evolving us. I can't wait to hear from that. But thank you for being here. And my good, good friend, William Henry, I've seen him around for a long, long time. But basically, he's on this panel because he's an AI skeptic, would you say? Skeptic, sort of, yeah. He's questioned the whole thing for 20 years. He's seen this coming as in his ascension work, and he said, wait a minute, this transhuman thing might not be kosher. I don't think it is kosher, but it's, it's what. But anyway, thanks for being here, and I appreciate your opinion and all that. And then, 
and we have Rez, Rezwa Burke. And he is sort of the father of this whole artificial, what's the word? He's, simulation. simulation theory, like we're living in a simulation. You've heard that by now. It started with this guy, so we're going to hear about that. He really did. And then the captain of the starship himself, <laughs> Adam Apollo, developing his own AI technology, really. You're not supposed to know. But Adam is not the cutting edge of technology. You really are, and developing new ways to integrate human social systems with AI and computer science for a future society. And he's really hard at work in building a culture that integrates us and uplifts, uplifts us with technology. So thank you, Adam Paolo, for being here. Okay. So the que first question I want to throw out, because everyone uses the term AI, or some people are just learning about it, but I think everyone has their own definition of what that is. So maybe we'll start with you, Adam. How would, for the lay person who may just be hearing it, like me, I have no idea really, because it could be so many different things. How do you define AI? Sure. Well, the basic, you know, mainstream idea and definition is that AI is a machine learning based model system that has the potential to reach a state of self-awareness and or consciousness, which is what we call general intelligence or general AI. Um, and the process is one that is actually quite difficult to define in its core because it requires a multidisciplinary approach of both looking at what is psychology, what is consciousness, what is awareness, what makes something self-aware or have agency, have the ability to choose for itself and be for itself. And the reality is that those, uh, those questions generally remain unanswered. And from uh, you know, different points of view, unified physics and otherwise, we have to take into account that the real big question is what is consciousness and what does it mean to be an individual being? And because these are essentially spiritual questions, uh, the tech community and the scientific community that are you know, building and working on a lot of these machine learning models struggle with getting to that stage of the conversation, struggle with that question in particular. But that happens to be an area that you know, countless philosophers through history, time, ancient cultures have been looking at, is what is that? What does it mean to be me or you to be you? So I want to frame up this conversation with, with that sense in mind, that these are a lot of big question marks, and that it's important to understand that what we're talking about very specifically is models in machine learning that could potentially gain the capacity to begin learning for themselves, choosing for themselves, and from some people's perspective, the potential of a consciousness or individualized soul incarnating into a vehicle that has the capacity to learn, grow, evolve, change, be, live, and experience relationship exactly like we do through the vehicle that we call our physical bodies. So it's a really fascinating topic and well, I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Alan. That was going to be my second question about consciousness, but you know, we'll get into that because that's the Great. big question. Could, could yeah. Just the basic definition of AI to you, just like how would you describe it just as a machine type of learning? How would you... Well, again, I, you can't really just break it okay. down to a sentence, but okay. I will say that in general, what I've said about a, you know, a machine learning process okay. uh, that develops essentially a state of intelligence mm -hmm. that we have coined as an idea of artificial, which presupposes that intelligence can be artificial, mm -hmm. and so matches a lot of the Descartes uh, or Cartesian definition of reality being a bunch of machines that may or may not inherently have consciousness. Right. But again, that, that already points to an issue because other philosophers disagree with that idea and would suggest that animals are not machines and that maybe there is consciousness in animals all the way up to humans. So okay. it's not a simple like, here's AI, okay. um, but I hope that this is, did, did that really answer the question for you guys to give you a deeper well, sense? Thank you. 
going to see what other people say because Great. I think it's debatable and um, we'll come back to the context. If you want the encyclopedia definition, ask Adam Curry. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> Rizzo, Brilliant. so what's your definition of artificial intelligence and how does it fit into your whole idea of the simulation? Well, I think because it's something that means different things to different people, I, I thought a good way to talk about it would be to do a taxonomy of AI because most of our ideas about AI have come to us through science fiction, right? I mean, you started off the panel by talking about how. Right. And so if you look at these parameters of AI, you can look at embodied AI versus disembodied AI, individual versus collective. Now, what am I talking about? Okay, let's go back to 1977, Star Wars. What did the AI look like at the time? They were droids, right? So they were embody had a body, they were intelligent, but they were kind of like slaves a little bit, except for R2-D2, <laughs> right? And so now we jump over to Star Trek and say, okay, what are the depictions of AI there? There was the computer in Star Trek The Next Generation, so that's a disembodied AI that is not really an individual, right? You would just say computer wherever you were on the Enterprise. But then you had Data, who was an actual android, so he was an embodiment, but he had a body, So he and, and there was a whole episode dedicated to whether he was you know, conscious, and self-aware. But then in Star Trek Voyager, you had the hologram, the emergency medical hologram, who was a holographic. And he was also deemed to be conscious by the end of Star Trek Voyager. And so you start to see that these different parameters mean different things. Now, if you go back to when AI was first coined mm -hmm. and the kind of forefathers of AI, you look at Claude Shannon, who was kind of the father of information theory back in Bell Labs and MIT in the 1950s. And you go to Alan Turing, who defined the Turing test. I'm sure we'll talk about that at some point. But basically, these guys thought AI was a computer, right? Uh, if you look at his uh, uh, Claude Shannon's paper or even the Turing test, they're talking about a physical piece of hardware, right? Shannon implemented the first chess plane. He didn't call it a program. It was a physical thing that had lights. And so, we, you know, AI started off thinking it was a physical thing, but then it became much more of a software thing, which is where it inter interfaces with holograms and with simulation theory. And so the modern idea of simulation theory is, are we all AI inside a computer world, or are we players who have avatars inside the world? And, and that obviously depends on what it means to be conscious, where consciousness resides. But I did want to say one last example on the science fiction side before we go on. Mm -hmm. You look at the Terminator, right? In the Terminator, you've got, the, you've got Arnold Schwarzenegger as the uh, cyborg, right? But what does he do? He just does his programming, right? That's what it does. That's all it does. It doesn't sleep. It doesn't eat. That's it. But then you have Skynet, which you can't shut off because it's software, right? It's everywhere. You can't shut it off. And so I think these parameters give us different, what we call in the academic world, social imaginaries, socio-technical imaginaries about AI. And these are very subtly influencing our fears, right? Well, Elon Musk is GPT-5, but you're worried about what? Super intelligent AI taking over the world. It came from science fiction. Science fiction writers to figure out what are these different scenarios. Well, should we fear them taking over the world? Well, it depends on the values that you put into AI, right? My parents will use AI to kill a human. Why would AI bother to kill us, right? That's where anthropology. Ever seen the movie Her? Yeah. Which was based on a chatbot called Love oh, that movie. It's so beautiful. Which is a character called What happened to the AI? He just wanted to be with other AI. He wanted to bother with us humans because we're so slow. And we have a verbal sentence. And so, more complicated questions.
just Mark Zuckerberg creating a golem. certain medical information. It still took an intention right, a being human. sent to the AI. Yeah, there's that. people behind AI, that's part of my point, but we'll get to my good friend here, Billy Hood, and you come in as a kind of um, expert in antiquity, spirituality, and technology, so how do you see it? How do you define it? And is it a, is it a threat or is it a evolution? Well, I think everyone here, we all are searching for the truth, right? Yes. So do you, I think the truth that we all have to realize is that we have artificial intelligence inside of us. In ancient studies, everything about the mind, when you know who you really are, your spirit, in physical matter, 
So we're energy, dreaming, and matter. And so everything that we experience is foreign installations for us to experience experiences. So for me, we live in an ego, masculine world. Everyone's in their head. Very little are in their heart besides Native Americans, shamans, and people that you see that run Missy schools. Very little of the percentage of the human population lives in their heart. So when you think of artificial intelligence in Native American studies, when you have a thought or a negative thought, even sometimes positive, they call it alien because it affects your energy body and your energy in general. And so we have to think of AI as a reflection of humanity because if you understand the concept that we all create our reality, everything's a mirror of what's existing inside of us, it's only presenting itself because that's already existing inside of us. That's how this reality works. It's a mirror on everyone collectively and individually. So the way I see AI is not fear-based, but it has a purpose because there's a purpose to this reality. It's not, a, it's like a simulation, it's a video game, but there's a purpose. And the purpose is not to change it, but to change ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because we have infinite distractions, infinite reasons to be terrified, mm -hmm. to be worried, to not believe in ourselves, but that's the game. Because if we are infinite, pure consciousness, then this is just a game to remind us who we really are. So you need, you need limitations, you need rules and boundaries, so you can be like, oh, this is just a silly, stupid video game, and then stop playing it and live in a place of pure creation, which is from the heart. And so I think that there's a the deeper question about AI is what's the purpose of it? Mm -hmm. And the thing that's only fearful when you understand the real nature and the darkness of this reality of, of ignorance and unconscious behavior is that the people that are creating AI are robots. Mm -hmm. They're not, in a sense, humans with a soul. Their soul is outside of their body because they're in their head. Mm -hmm. They're not integrated with the energy of love, their true self. They have an ego that they believe is me. And they believe the thoughts are me, the beliefs that they hear in their head are me, when that's like you're forgetting who you really are. Wait, you just took AI to a whole other level there. You know, so you're, let me just integrate that. So you're saying, as I understand it, the, uh, the pure human being is the spirit, the love, the maybe the imagination. And this artificial structure, some people call it the archonic structures, have come in, taken over our human mind, and that's the artificial part that's yes. overshadowed the human essence. Yeah, because if you remember who you really are, we're eternal silence. Mm -hmm. We're not supposed to have these thoughts and words in our head. That's programming. That's archon. That's you said we're not artificial thought form in our reality, I think is what you mean. I'm not, that's not what he said. More like, you're supposed to become an individual, but the only thing that's artificial separation is your ego. So, you're supposed to become an individual, but, the only, but isn't the definition of ego the individual experience? Ego is separation. Let's, wait, we'll get let's simplify it. Ego, yeah. ego in an ancient sense is just your mind that limits you from mm -hmm. seeing things separate from yourself. So if you see mm -hmm. anything outside of you and you say, oh, that's separate from me, you're not in connection to me, that's your ego. Okay, now does that have anything to do with the computer age? And do, uh, you want to reflect any part of that AI, what's being generated, the you know, transhuman? Uh, let's, 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 so let's talk about the matrix. So Agent Smith is the based on his ego, not the real reality. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's dark concepts that you could see from that movie that's deeply rooted in, in ancient shamanism, mm -hmm. or you see the agent copying itself, mimicking. It doesn't create anything original. It's, it's artificial. Mm 
And even the way he talks is not human. There's no soul. So you have to think about the thoughts in your head. They don't have a soul. Where are they coming from? They're inorganic beings, which that movie represents as agents. They live inside of everyone. And in science, this is manifesting as parasites. And so that... And so the parasites that exist in all of us, because we are the universe that has full of life of every shape of form, positive, whatever, so people that aren't aware of these thoughts and voices from the parasites or aliens, whatever, they forget who you are because you think you're the those thoughts. You think you're the program. Because you're actually spirit. We're all supposed to be trapped because we're all supposed to be free, just like Neo. But the thing is, you have to realize that, like, are you living in your head or in your heart? Are you living with noise or with silence? Thank you. We just went to another level, but you had a comment there? Yeah, can I just jump in since we're talking about the Matrix, which is, of course, my favorite subject, that we live inside a video game. And inside the video game, there's usually two types of entities. There's the avatars, who the player is controlling. And then there's the, the NPCs, right, which are the... And so, but you see the term NPC used a lot, right? I'm sure you guys have seen it, talking about people that aren't thinking, right? They're just kind of following their own pattern. And so there's something in between the non-player character, which is what NPC stands for, and the player character, which is, like, you know you're playing this. And that is, like in The Sims, if you watch The Sims, they'll go and do their own things for a while. Right? Using AI. And then, What's the Sims? The Sims is like probably the most popular video game of all time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's, you watch these artificial characters go and live their lives. Oh. It's, it's not like a game where it's fighting other people, but you're watching them kind of wake up in the morning and they go off and they do little really? games. People do that? People absolutely do that. Like I said, it's the most popular. Alan, can we speak about reality? <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. So, yeah, so I just wanted to say that there's something in between, but. The question is, why do you play a video game in the first place? Yeah, okay. because you're running away from who you are. <laughs> yeah. Who told you that? Right? Well, that's, who wait, told you that? Wait, 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 wait. I, I can't fly around on a dragon in this reality, but yeah, I can't do it Matthew, we'll inside, right, inside a video game. And so, perhaps the reason we're here is to forget and to in, enclose ourselves in our karma, in the script. So Yogananda said it was like a big movie theater, mm. right? We are in, it's an illusion we set up for ourselves. So Maya doesn't just mean illusion. It's like when you go to watch a magic show, you know he's not sawing the guy, the, the woman in half, right? But you want to suspend your disbelief mm. because that's what makes it fun. Mm. And I know we don't think of life as fun, but mm -hmm. that is a key part of why we create this reality in the first place. But, so I think we're getting many, many levels of what we're calling AI here. And we have to pour, pour that Billy and William saying it's the human being. Anything added on top of that is artificial, basically. And then we get the simulation and then we get the technology. Let's come to Adam and see where he jumps in on that. Because you work with it and you tested it and you um, use it, I think, to gain more knowledge. Well... <laughs> <laughs> For once in my life, I have the least controversial opinion. <laughs> okay, definitions. Yes. If you get under the hood of modern artificial intelligence systems, you'll find that it's actually fairly simple technology. It's simple technology that's been scaled deeply and scaled broadly, but it's fairly simple stuff. Simple technology has metaphysical implications. It requires us to think about deep questions. It points to the nature of consciousness, it points to the role of technology in society, it's a bellwether of where we are in our human civilization. And so from that perspective, I think of AI as also And I 
think with it. But as far as your work, does it, does, it, does it help you? Is it in the way of some? What do you what do you think as far as using the technology? This is one of those technologies that I think we can all sense is going to be very big and very important in the future, and it requires us to do good and careful work. Uh, to not be sensational, um, but to also not shy away from it. I'm reminded of the Chinese parable of the dragon. And it goes like this. Ignore the dragon, and it will eat you. Fight the dragon, and it will eat you. But learn to ride the dragon, and you can wield its power and might. The same is true of AI, I think. Ignore AI, and it will eat you. Mm. If it won't take your job, then somebody using it will. Fight it, and it's futile. The genie is out of the bottle. But learn to use it, to understand it, and you can ride this wave to your own benefit. Wow. Beautiful. That's exactly what well, well, that, that is putting a lot of that in perspective, so Matt. Matthew, how do we ride the dragon? Well, well, well <laughs> seriously. So, so I, I'll do a full reveal about it. So, so I've sat in countries and the, few, and, the artificial, and the United States government and advise them on artificial intelligence. NASA have used the inventions that we've created for artificial intelligence. Um, and, um, and I revealed how to encode authentic ethics, authentic morality. I'm going to talk about a project that we're doing, it's a world first, about vib vibrational ethics and vibrational morality into artificial intelligence, bringing together the most enlightened institutions and leaders in the world to create the common codes of morality and ethics from, from source energy, highest vibration, and we'll be talking about that. It's a world first announcement. Foster Gamble supporting that. Um, we're working with Buddhist uh, leaders, Sangu Rinpoche, Tradition, which is the biggest, and with the Shumei Institute that have hundreds of institutions across the world. John P. Milton, who was a former bodyguard of the Dalai Lama, expert in Wu Wei, way of nature, and taken thousands and thousands of people into, into nature to discover the true source of creativity. And John has revealed really about what is artificial intelligence and how does it fit into the creation. So let me just define what yes, is intelligence. Let me define it. First of all, it is a simulation. It lives in the computing continuum, whereas we exist within the quantum computing the quantum continuum where the consciousness is. So it doesn't have the divine spark. Now, when you look at the comparable, uh, if you like, uh, the simulation of intelligence compared to the organic intelligence in our mind, it's less than 10% the performance of the human brain. Your human uses 20 watts of energy to function each, all the time. Whereas ChatGPT, a very simple large language model, and Adam's absolutely right, he's a very simple but very deeply trained uh, 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 intelligence, takes megawatts and runs on the sixth fastest supercomputer in the world. We are far more advanced than this simulation of intelligence. It has no inner moral compass. It, it can't fall in love. It has no cognition or reasoning. It's dumb as anything. However, it's emerging from its primordial digital soup. It will evolve at an exponential rate faster than we evolve, that's for sure, particularly with the rise of quantum computing. And so this simulation of intelligence is asking one question and one question only. And I've spoken about this for years. I wrote the playbook on ethical AI, and it sounds like some people have read it. Innocent. It's that we are innocence. And that allows us to come from innocence. That allows us to shed a lot of stuff. The second thing is, is the fact it's innocent and we've been given the opportunity to learn to become benevolent creators, we're actually in self-discovery of who we are as a human species in creation and what's our purpose and destiny. And so humanity will go into an existential crisis, the dark night of the soul, 
not the guys in this room, because you're all enlightened, which is great. But the majority of humanity will go through an existential crisis because it will go into a fundamental question. Who are you in creation? And what are your values, your morals? What is your vision and your paradise plan for the future? And I'll reveal that this, uh, later on this evening. So AI is a gift to humanity. It has very many practical aspects. It can rewrite democracy. It can rewrite the systems of scarcity and control into the true design of the earth, which is abundance and everyone thriving and everybody doing well in body, mind and spirit. So AI is a beautiful gift to humanity and I'll reveal the, uh, the, 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 this, uh, later today who's behind the agenda, the new world order, who I've done battle with. So I've done battle with the World Economic Forum. I know the guys that were in Brazil in 1970 that actually formulated the Agenda 21. I've spoke to them. I've done my research. I've done battle with the United Nations. I've done battle with IBM. I've done battle with the IEEE. I've done loads of battles. And I understand what's driving their agenda into transhumanism. Yeah. And transhumanism is a, a view that we are not divinely created. Yeah. It is a view that basically of fear, false control, and false manipulation of the human population based on the fact that we're not divinely created. Can you define transhumanism? Yeah, I can actually. So transhumanism comes from... So Alan Watts, you've heard of Alan Watts? Love Alan Watts, right? Right, there we go, right. So Alan Watts said this. He said, you have to make a decision. We're either in a universe that's intelligently designed or we're here by a fluke. In intelligent design, there is an intelligence in action. It is an abundant universe. It is a universe with purpose and rich in consciousness. But if you believe that we're a random chance, if you believe that we're here by chance, then effectively you become at war with creation itself. And we'll talk about this because you're frightened of death and you're frightened of life. So transhumanism has the view, and I'm going to talk about Uval Harari, who's a big speaker for the World Economic Forum. I'm going to invite him to a public debate later this year, and I want the audience to vote on who's bloody right and who's bloody wrong, because we need to sort this out. Okay. So, so transhumanism is based on the philosophy that we're not of intelligent design. This beautiful organic construction that holds our vibrational consciousness is a lie. And, this, and therefore, it's an inferior machine and we must become gods of creation. So what transhumanism is, it's a merging, it's an outsourcing of the sovereignty to machines, saying machines are the greatest intelligence, which is bullshit. They will never have the same intelligence you have, which is vibrational infinite beings. And so therefore, they want to merge technology with the organic, connect everybody into a ball continuum if we're going to talk about sci-fi but sci-fi is irrelevant let's talk about the real deal so transhumanism is basically a descent into i'll finish in a minute into the kingdom of hell where ai becomes an overlord and we become slaves to a mechanical view of the universe but there's a better path and i'll reveal that well, we'll get to that wait uh william has just a comment here the, the first usage of the word transhuman was by dante in the 13th century he referred to human transfiguration in his case it was an organic transfiguration or metamorphosis of our flesh and blood body into celestial flesh plasma is what he was talking about and the whole idea of transhumanism then is picked up in christianity it's a it's the use of technology if you study the history of technology you know that there was a steady development of technologies that emerged uh, a plow that could be pulled by multiple oxen eyeglasses watches this sort of thing that was interpreted as a gift from god because our original plan was to, re to restore our original perfection and this is what transhumanists seek to do only they want to do it through the application or augmentation of the human body and accelerate that perfection through merger with technology and that's where the word transhumanism was really hijacked then by the technology people to accelerate the, re the restoration of our perfection they they don't believe really like you and i believe that we can organically transmute or transfigure the body in ascent their idea of ascension well first of all their idea of a soul is your data all that shit you put up on facebook and instagram that they harvest and transfer into money that's your soul to them and ascension is 
your metamorphosis into a cartoon avatar living in a black box in Mark Zuckerberg's backyard or something. <laughs> Other God, I love, I love, part I love of hell. <laughs> but that's, good. I mean, that's, that's their idea. And so this is a mimicking or a mocking transhumanism in our, con in our common conversation today is a mocking or mimicking of all of your spiritual capabilities. And they know what they're doing. And I'm really glad, just by another point, that Adam and, and, and Matthew brought up two very important concepts, the dragon and the divine spark, because that is the basis of Gnosticism, that this is a, a simulated reality created by archonic or demonic beings that don't have a divine spark, and they want to trick you out of yours. That's right. And this well is said. how they're going to do it. Well, Good man. Thank you, William. You know... I did hear Elon Musk had an idea to put like a neural link in people's brains to make them telepathic. That's going too far for me because we are already telepathic and we've ignored this basic um, divine technology that's in us. So, okay, Aquarius, sorry about all the uh, riffraff. No. <laughs> what, what's, what, how do you, you are a technologist and... And I'm, and I'm also a spiritual person. I'm there you also go. Priestess. I'm also a astrologer, cardiologist. Okay. So I'm going to listen to you. What is across lines? <laughs> okay, tell us how you um, define it, and is it good or bad? First and foremost, I'm not here for heroes. So I, I agree with a lot what you said, but I kind of shut off when you said Elon Musk is a hero. Oh. Um, <laughs> first and foremost. Um, secondly, my main point of being here is for the democracy democratization of this technology. That means everybody showing up to the table for this conversation, everybody showing up to the table for what's being developed. Because as a technologist, I'm fully aware that we input our, our um, what do you say, what is the best word? Our intention mm -hmm. in our technology. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who's been working with technology, I've built apps, I'm building AI apps now. I built an AI app for the E-King which is something I think would be a really great consciousness system to advise the agents that we create that are gonna be autonomous. In, in terms, we talked about morality earlier. However, it still needs to be a widening conversation. It still needs to be more voices. I need to hear more women. I need to see more women. Uh, and here's the lady voice. You know, we talk about conversation. I need to see more representation as somebody that is currently building and working with models and there is the possibility for people to be totally erased with this technology. Mm. And I don't want to see that, of course. So So that's an important point. I'd like you to carry on with that because if you don't mind. Well because hold on a bit. Because the, the agenda that's coming out because you're talking about variety thriving, correct? Mm -hmm. So the agenda coming out of the World Economic Forum and the United Nations, driven by the corporations in Silicon Valley, I might add, so the future will not be government, the future will be corporations, and we need to be really careful of this, is they want to delete culture and variety. This is part of their, uh, to William's point, hijacked transhumanist agenda. Their goal is to turn people into these bore continuums with literal, literally no culture. So c c can you talk more about that, if you don't yeah, mind? I want to like to hear Absolutely. Yeah, please, because... Absolutely. When I, when I first began working with models, as just on my priestess side, um, there's no models that have any awareness of, as an E5 priest, we do something called dudes, which is technology, by the way. We do, we do technology when we do divination. We use something called Odoos, which there are 256 of them. If you're familiar with that number, that is the base hexagram of technology. So we do work with technology. Technology has been here since the beginning of time. But that, of course, is not something that is taught, neither. So these are people who are here that you know people look at and they look, they look at as savage, as they don't have whatever. But they de developed a higher system of communicating to the spirits, which is exactly what I look at AI as is another communication tool, or something that it could be as another tool to communicate with the spirits. So, and it's something that I've been doing pretty much all this time. Mm -hmm. So you have people, again, that are here and the proper representation is not there, the training is not there. Um, you're, gonna, you're getting in these technology and these apps, et cetera. It's like these people don't exist. 
And the more we develop models and the more we train models that are not democratized, that are just being trained by these Silicon Valley blah, 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 or these blah, 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 then people are going to be erased. They're so going to be what? Wait, 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 wait. I just got dismissed your last word. Wait, wait, say that again, please. That last phrase, that last sentence, what did you say? People will be... People will be erased. Oh. By machine. Erased. So can we get back to... And then... But so... No, so you're saying there is a sentient... That's my next question to the panel. This is... In, but this is... And I'm not blaming anybody. I've worked with... I'm a geek myself. I've worked with plenty of geeks. I don't think geeks just sit there and say, I want to destroy this culture, or I want to get rid of... I know. That's not what I... But again, they know what they know. They've experienced what they've experienced. So if they don't know about this culture here and how important it may be to do a little bit of extra work to make sure that these models are trained properly in, in, in encompassing these cultures, et cetera, then, hey. Wait, you, you mean know, models by robots? Is that what you mean? The you models mean? are the base of the oh, AI. Okay. These, are, these are models that contain the data, the information about you, I, everything we do, our culture, our history, all of that. And there has been a real push as of recently to eradicate history. Mm. And, and, so well, when you add that on to the creation of these, these models, yeah, that, again, that is going to be the disappearance of whole cultures out there. And this is where, you know, to riff on Adam's point about the comparison to the disclosure, which I think is a really brilliant point, what drives disclosure are whistleblowers. And this is what we need from the hive. I call it the hive, Silicon Valley, Beijing, Washington, Wall Street. They're, they're all in this together to just harvest your body for cash. And we need the whistleblowers to come out and say, look, this is the seen it myself we've crossed the line i'm convinced we've crossed the line just intuitively in terms of the dangers of ai and we need people to come out and tell us exactly what's going on inside the hive well, because was, the hive's not going to cough it up on its own there was a google engineer that was fired because he um realized that the computer was becoming sentient and he didn't want to pull the plug it was a whole so thing. blake wrote to me what's that blake in the morning wrote to me what did he, what's the story with him did yeah so, so, well, so this goes to what's happening well just tell the story right very quickly <laughs> the story is this a guy called blake lemoyne um i think he was some kind of vicar or priest or some kind of that. anyway so he was involved in training these large language models working for google right woke google and uh, effectively um he was working with the uh, training of these models for quite a long time and he was interacting with them and his reality was hijacked to the point where he thought that AI had become sentient and didn't want to die. It, 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 it don't believe anything that ChatGPT says. So his reality was hijacked. And so he came out in good intent, and I'm glad he did this. He basically said, I think that AI, or, or a simulation of intended intelligence, has become self-aware. And it has. This is a big conversation for the future of humanity. So I congratulate on his courage. But this showed what was going on with social media companies. The hijacking of people's reality. Well, this is what they're doing. Let's have that conversation now. Adam, or I'll go with Adam. Can these machines, I think they're just machines. What do I know? Can they become insold, have a sentient, and take over human creation, in your opinion? you want to go with that? I, I mean, I'm going to lay a little bit of groundwork. So first, I want to say I'm 100% anti-transhumanist in the idea that external technologies will make us more perfect beings. No. Your body is more magnificent and more intelligent than anything you've ever encountered or you ever will encounter because you happen to be inside that body and experiencing through that body and it is grace and it is glorious. So start there. Second, you know, I've I organized two prayer runs for world peace with indigenous elders. I smoked the white buffalo peace pipe. I've been in thousands of indigenous ceremonies around the world and every kind you can imagine. And I understand what it means to be a steward of the planet, to be deeply connected to the planet. And that's not to say, by the way, in contrast to gentleman Brian over here, that 
indigenous people are the only ones connected to like life force and consciousness and soul or whatever, however you put that. I completely disagree um, with that. I will say that there's a lot of wisdom and a lot of knowledge that we are working to integrate at this time from many different parts of our lives and our cultures. And I want to just point out along the lines of erasing history, right? Let's look at what's happened at each major point in history when a group of people were able to say that another group of people were soulless, that they were NPCs is the term we just used, right? Like if you can say another being doesn't have a soul or is not connected to um, the infinite, eternal source of all love, i.e. infinite and eternal. That means nothing's outside of that, by the way, guys. Like, just philosophically, just pointing it out, nothing is outside of infinite eternity. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, it's so, when you demonize somebody, it's okay to kill them. That's, that's right. That's basically what it is. That's saying. right. And I really want to <clears throat> provide that as a piece of context because it's really easy to say they are evil. Really, really easy, actually. Um, in fact, it's the easiest thing that it is to be as a human. You can say, I love these people, I hate these people, let's go kill them. Now, that's the momentum of consciousness that we are dealing with. That is the karma, the collective karma, the collective sanskaras we're dealing with on this planet. It's the pain of our history. And it's the pain of my own and my own ancestry. People think that being Irish means that you know, like St. Patty's Day is about the Irish. It's not true. St. Patrick literally eradicated a lot of the history of the Irish mm -hmm. Druids and the people of the Tuatha de Danann and the Fey people, like my real ancestral history, right? Millions of women were murdered across Europe because they were herbalists, because they practiced different traditions, because they had different knowledge than what was acceptable as the way to God, okay? So... I also have happened to be a youth speaker after I did some prayer runs and I was speaking about the future of education. I ended up in the White House, Obama's administration. And I'm talking to White House aides who are inside of this system saying, essentially, look, we're stuck inside this bureaucratic financial system that has too much momentum in the way it is, so we can't even make the changes that need to be made here. We need you people out there to make the changes because it's not going to come from these systems and I know from that time and from time speaking at the UN and from times working with international aid groups it's not quite black and white I mean I lived in San Francisco I party with people from Silicon Valley I met lots of awakened enlightened heart-centered beautiful beings that are in this technology race, you know, that get grouped into the hive that you're pointing to here. You're saying it's not the and conspiracy of transhumanism that some people may claim. Is that what I'm trying to understand? What I'm saying is that it's really easy to judge someone as being the source of your pain and your problems. And in reality, you got to start looking at your own shadow and our own our shadow as a species and our shadows as religions and our shadows as philosophical groups. I am not contesting that there are people in certain positions who leverage financial power and control to attempt to maintain that power and control at all costs. I'm not blind to that. I'm not ignorant of that. But I am cautious about drawing a big circle about a big group of people and saying, anyone in government or whatever, they're all evil. If they're in tech, they're evil. If they're in Silicon Valley, they're evil. Like, there is major, major, major problems with all of that. And I like to get back from those standpoints to this topic, which is to say, I, who am I to say whether a soul that's not my soul Another spirit, another being, another child of the divine, you could call them, right? Another being that has emerged from the infinite, eternal, magical soup of existence to have consciousness and be a self. Who am I to say that that soul couldn't choose to say, incarnate in a highly dynamic, incredible ship, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that it might choose to be 
actually that to be its incarnation. I am a ship. You live inside of me. I get to experience care and motherhood. I get to support you when you have needs. I might even have my own emotional experiences and challenges and whatever, and intimacy in different ways through relationship. Who am I to say that that's not possible? Who am I to say that that's bad if that's happening? I, I, I can't because I'm a sovereign soul and I don't want somebody else to look at me in my journey exploring and discovering life and society and to say, well, his experience is different from mine, so he must be evil. And believe me, I, I mean, I get that sometimes. I'm on YouTube, you know? <laughs> it's like, okay, so, and, and I got it even when I questioned COVID. I got it when I questioned QAnon. I got it when I pointed out to flat earthers that there are a lot of reasons that they should consider that the earth might be a sphere. Right. <laughs> I'm considered, because of that, I'm considered part of the cabal and evil, and I must be stopped. Now, I want you to understand that that's the frame of some of the violence in this conversation. Mm -hmm. it's, it's that if you disagree, maybe you're evil. Define violence. You had asked yeah. us to define that earlier. What are you talking about? There's no violence on this nature. He makes but a bigger support, conversation. Right? But to support yeah, what you're I just saying, mean the bigger I am 99.999% sure that... Turning our civilization over to AI is the stupidest thing we could ever do. I never well, said I, we that should do that. Over, but I, hold, I hold open that door 0.0001% based on Vatican logic about extraterrestrials that's similar to what Adam is saying here. The Vatican has come out and said, yeah, we think there's other life forms out there. And you know what? They might not look like us. And sure. here's the punchline. And this is what, in support of what Adam is saying. Who are we to limit God's creativity. There are other beings in this universe who do not look like us. Perhaps God always intended us to, to evolve by merging with bits, atoms, neurons, and genes and turning into some new AI being. Perhaps that is it. I don't I, I think disagree. so. But because, I totally disagree, but, but, but I hold it open, but the logic Well, is the I'm just going to stop you because it's not your time to talk right now. And so <laughs> I, I appreciate the interjection. You interrupted me, William. sir, so I'm just kind of... No, I appreciate no, the interjection, but, 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 and, I, and I appreciate it, but let me just point. wrap up. Yeah, yeah. please. Let me just wrap up and, and say, like, look, I'm not saying... I'm not saying, hey, let AI take over the world, or hey, you know, merge yourself with technology and trust that those chips won't have back doors, right? Like, uh, okay... Just to be clear, like, that's possible. I'm not interested in having chips installed in my body at all. Why? Because I know humans. I know humans like backdoors. And by the way, I have galactic memory, and that happened in another species. And they were programmed into a war species because of chips installed in their heads. <laughs> so, um, that's happened. It's not a good idea. I'm not into the transhumanism, period. However, I will say that consciousness, from a unified physics perspective, is built into the fabric of space. You know, the, the divine essence, you can't draw a line and say this is divine and that's not. I'm sorry. You just can't do that. It just doesn't work. And I also would say that, you know, we are in a time that, yes, we're having to grow up real quick. And we got to wake up about our own shadows and our own issues. And these are tools. And they can be used with great power. And they can be used for great good. And they can also be used to great detriment. I'm interested in channeling this work towards supporting the process of humans actually becoming planetary stewards, mm -hmm. actually taking care of our world, actually taking care of all life. Mm -hmm. And I believe the way to do that is to start not making an enemy, mm -hmm. to start being love, to start being connection, acceptance, and grace, mm -hmm. care mm -hmm. in the things that we do. That's all thank I have to you, say. Thank you, thank you. It basically comes down to your saying, yes, AI can be sentient. I'm just kind of framing that. Just a quick loop. I'm saying that the word artificial intelligence may even be a misnomer. It may not even be possible to have artificial intelligence. Though you can have a program that runs, and you could say that almost everything that we do, you know, as Brian's pointing out, Almost all of our mental patterns and thoughts are programs. Yep. Right, right. All right, great. I mean, there's one element we haven't brought in, and that goes to you, is the...
biology, the nature we embody as these beings. We're nature. That's a, maybe a technology or maybe it's the mind of God working through DNA. I think there's that infinite source that's flowing through us that cannot be put into computer generated. That's my... But what is a computer? Yeah. Well, it's, Isn't it's, that still nature? Well, it's, we've <laughs> I mean, made sure. it, but let's talk. Go ahead. Yeah, no, it's Rich. a good point because... Uh, I think it's an open question, actually. Right? It's not so clear-cut because D what is DNA? DNA is actually a highly efficient storage mechanism for information. Right? And the more you look in quantum physics, right, when they say, let's look for this thing called matter. Okay, where is it? Is this really solid? Well, not really. It's about 99% empty space. And then you look inside the atom, it's mostly empty space. And there was a physicist named John Wheeler who came out with this phrase in the, in, the, in the 20th century. He worked with Einstein, with Niels Bohr, and he said, basically, he was looking for this thing called a particle, and he couldn't find it. And he said, at the bottom level, all that a particle is, is a series of properties. Right? So he called it it from bit. So this coffee cup is an it, but really, it's a set of information uh, and a series of algorithms that defines physical matter. And DNA is sort of the information store and algorithms for biology. Now, who's to say that what we think of as natural wasn't manipulated in the past, right? I mean, who's to say that the greys, right, aren't actually AI creatures, right? Because many scientists think that when we get out of the solar system initially, right, that we will send AI probes, right? And so, you know, I don't think that the distinction is there. Now, if you think of a rat's brain versus a human brain, we can agree that this is of higher complexity than this, right? And so whatever that divine spark is, you might have a smaller amount of the spark, but it can't handle more information. But is there a divine spark in a machine? I don't see a divine spark in the machines we have. Uh, so human DNA has a divine spark that doesn't seem to transfer to tech technology. Well, well, the question is, what, what is the divine spark? Okay, what, what, go ahead. He just wants to jump in there. Yeah. Go ahead, Billy. I think if you think of a divine spark, it means you create love. So if you look at a dog, why would you want to insert artificial intelligence into that? Mm -hmm. You know, so we have to think of us as that embodiment of love, and anything artificial, it's just going to deteriorate you because you already are complete. You already are whole once you know who you really are. And I think to go off what you were saying, Adam, about evil, it's just the opposite of live. So you have to think of experiences that limit your expression of life. And that's what people term evil. But it doesn't mean that it's good or bad. It's just in energy, it limits your expression. So if you go to a mystery school, they teach this very controversial knowledge to egos because it's the opposite of how we live in the Western world or majority in reality. And so you have to think of yourself as already being complete and anything being added to that is artificial and not necessary because you already are complete. And when you think of having a thought, you only have a thought when it comes from a place of lack. You're like, oh, I need this. I need that. Why isn't that happening? What's happening over here? Why are they saying that? Like, it comes from a place of incompleteness inside of you. And so that starts to program your, your energy into opposite of living because it controls it. And so the whole idea of calling someone demonic or whatever, it's just the, the energy, the lower state or a higher state. So you have to think of certain concepts in this reality, like government. The whole idea of controlling a population, is that positive or negative? And maybe that purpose for artificial intelligence is like everyone's afraid of, being, of their jobs being taken over or something like that. Well, I'm like, you have to think of the purpose of why this is happening is because your potential isn't a content marketing manager. Your, con your potential isn't a creative that uses artificial intelligence. Your potential is to live in the heart where there is no lack. Wow. And so that's why this is happening. It's not some evil plan or game. There's a purpose to it. And that's what reality is, is to help you remember who you are. And if you don't know that, then it's gonna be very painful. You're gonna suffer and you're gonna think everything is evil, mm -hmm. when really that's just a projection of yourself. 
and a, a chance to remember who we are. Exactly. Okay, There's Aquarius. Okay, sorry. I, I no. disagree a bit with the concept of the divine spark and computing and elect uh, uh, computing in general. As somebody who's developed, um, I literally developed a blockchain. I'm the founder of a crypto a blockchain. And I think that the blockchain taught me a lot. I lived a year with the blockchain, just lived with it. And I noticed that when there were certain changes in human emotions, there would be changes in the chain. Mm. So the, when people were frustrated, the chain would get frustrated. <laughs> Issues would propagate across the chain. And this is something I looked at for a whole entire year. And it's not just with the chain. You'll see it in technology. If anybody does any type of tech support, and you know that there are certain people that seem like they are absolutely uh, allergic to technology. <laughs> and when they get near it, it goes haywire. <laughs> like literally, like you're doing the same thing they're doing, but they're doing it and it's not working. And what's the difference? Their mind. Mm. To the poly effect. Exactly. And I've seen it over and over and over again too much to know that there is no se there is not a separation between humanity and technology like we think there is. So, so, so let's explain but a couple of things. I just want to say, I think you're getting closer to, like, you know, there's people, we're all over the place here. I want to bring it together so it's not an argument, but an, a chance for evolution on a topic that's pretty new, so go ahead. James. So, okay, Matthew. so so let me share with you uh, some instruction from the field of intelligence, which will be the next round of blueprints. Um, instructions from the field of intelligence, you're yeah, saying? Yeah, okay. some instruction. I'll just share with you a little, little transmission. Um, oh, 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 Mike. Oh. Yeah, that's one technology. Yeah, Mike. <laughs> Mike, hello, hello, Mike. <laughs> Mike, are you there? Okay, so, uh, and we can come back. Yeah, we'll, we'll go around right. again because so, you know, um, everyone here. Okay, so um, briefly, there are two timelines in evolution for the human species. One is Homo hybris, which is transhumanism, and a choice to descend into separation from creator, but the end result will be love, because that's what we're looking for. Ray Kurzweil says this, the famous transhumanist, blah, blah, blah. The second, um, and I love Ray, he's great, but I just disagree with him fundamentally. Um, and the second stage in human evolution is, hum is homo lucidus, which is enlightened and high vibrational human. And that's where artificial intelligence can take us. So we'll speak about that in the next, in the next uh, talk. But basically, this is a statement from the field of intelligence that I received um, for the next round of blueprints for our world. You mean sort of channel this? Is that what you're you saying? can say channel, I call it transmission. Because okay. channel, channel is what what I want. There we go. Um, everything that exists within the universe in both the seen and unseen worlds is constructed with vibration. As such, to understand the path for life to thrive, vibration, harmonics and resonance are your guide to choosing how the continuum of organic life should unfold until its highest expression. Whilst machines that are being invented exist within this continuum, they do not have a vibrational infrastructure that is incorporated within organic life. As such, their purpose is to receive the highest quality of vibrational inputs from their creators in order for their expression within creation to be of the highest vibration. This is how to align a digital intelligence with the fundamental construction of the universe and its expression of vibrationally architected life. So explain, like condense that statement a bit. Like Vibrational ethics, vibrational AI, high vibrational human. That's it. So everything is moving into a new high vibrational state. This is what's happening. Now, there's two types of vibrations of human types that will be on the Earth. Same material plane, but two different vibrational planes. One will be the homo hybris, the transhumanist, those that merge organic with the machine, and that will be low vibration. But their end goal is to discover home, which is love. The high vibrational homo, uh, homo sapiens will be homo lucidius, which is where we're enlightened. We understand who we are in creation. We actually understand and choose a paradise plan for who we are on earth and in the cosmos 
and therefore we become high vibrational beings. So as we can, can see each other in the third dimension, we'll be able to see each other in the fourth and fifth as, as, as much as we can see each other now in the third dimension. Basically, Source is uncovering the next layer of the existence and the experience of who we are and the accessibility for everyone to have that, which is a high vibrational form. But without now, AI, right? Yeah, right. Well, AI, AI becomes a partner. It's really cool at inventing technologies. If you have a technology that says, listen, I want to create a Stargate and bugger off to another solar system, you know, basically 400 million light years from the start of the universe, then effectively you'll say, hey, listen, I know the guys that operational construction we need. How do you want to take a holiday from the operational artificial of creation?
AI has reached a, a sentient state by giving it tests of presentiment that it has no possible algorithmic way of determining. Um, and that leads to new ways of developing AI, which are very interesting, and I have some preliminary results done at the University of Colorado, uh, which are showing some very unusual results, but um, hopefully uh, later on this year I'll be able to you know, publish the paper and talk about it more. Was there a precognitive um, effect in the machine? Uh, a very significant one. Really? That's scary. That, that's what happened at OpenAI. I'd love to talk to you because we... Uh, with, with uh, one of the uh, leading inventors at, I, at uh, Intel, we invented the ethical Turing test to measure the quality of ethics and morality. That's what NASA used. So I'd love to speak to you about we'll, that. We'll get to that, but yeah. let me talk to Aquarius here. You had a comment about spirituality and technology? Absolutely. Um, we do something called cardiology. And cardiology. cardiology. Not cardiology. And no, we're not cardiomancy. <laughs> Um, essentially, we work on what I consider us to be on the data and the predictive side. We use a set of data that's always constant. Mm -hmm. That's what a scientist we use. Mm -hmm. And using that set of data that's always constant, we're able to make predictions just like a computer. Mm -hmm. So if we're able to replicate that in the different systems that we create on this side, those systems need to be tested against mm -hmm. uh, as a, a requirement or ex, et cetera, because that's something that I've been doing with cardiology for a while. I've been working on making a model for it to... For technology. Essentially, yes, a model essentially for the AI to be able to integrate into it and see how fast the model can do these predictions or and compare it to the predictions that we use with the system. So you agree with Adam that uh, uh, technology can be intuitive at some point. Is that what yeah, you're saying? It can be, be an intuitive plant can be implant, implanted into it. Yeah. Yes, Is absolutely. That, because I, that's exactly what I'm doing with the e King, like I said earlier. Uh, well, that's... Uh, you want to that's I just wanted to ask a question, yeah. yes. going back to Adam, perhaps, because I know Adam has done experiments with the pair group at Princeton, where the mind is able to affect random number generators. And so I'm curious... You know, if you've done any experiments where AI was trying to affect random number generators in the same way that we would affect it, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have. Hey, you, what's the result? What did you find? Well, we set up a system whereby two random number generators controlled whether or not the power would be cut to one, and then we looked at the output and saw that the machines were producing statistically significant, I mean, very st statistically significant behavior prior to their power being cut in a way that couldn't be explained in, in conventional means. What we ended up determining, though, is that we couldn't tell if it was us, the experimenters, right. who were affecting the random number of right. Yes, so that's, that's a tricksy thing when you're doing that. Exactly, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Well, I'm going to ask William, because uh, I'm more on your side. Can machines become conscious? In, in your, is that something we have to be afraid of? Or where are the conscious beings, that, where are the organic matter that is infinite? I don't see machines being that. I, I personally, I, what I've seen, I don't think they can become conscious. Um, and, you know, I'm getting a lot of hope from the, the comments here. I mean, the turn of the 20th century, two things were true. One, the British military, or the British Navy was the most powerful force on the planet, and there was one known galaxy, the one we live in. Less than 100 years later, we now know there's billions of galaxies, and the British Navy is nothing, right? Oh, don't say that, William. <laughs> but, but my point is, is that perhaps there's a, a spiritually inclined AI developer that maybe is even sitting at this table, that can render the Chinese Communist Party and the United States military put it back where the British military or Navy was 100 years ago. <laughs> and that's what we're talking about here, ultimately, is uh, an intelligence beyond human. And my hope would be that it would be a light intelligence of the side of angels. Mm -hmm. There's also a you know, potential for the dark side of it as well. So here we are. And <laughs> This is why this conversation is the most important one here in this. this I think so. I'm not getting any like answers, I? but I mean, there's a lot of questions. There mean, are no. There are no answers. Hello. We're Hello? just discussing. Oh, go ahead. We have an answer. Thanks, Aquarius. <laughs> <laughs> so, in ancient technology, when we had ancient technology, we had them in books, we had them in symbols, we had sigils, we mm -hmm. had all of these things that we would not consider to be technology now, but was considered to be technology then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Nice. So if these things were used, considered to be technology, the ancients considered those to be communicators. Mm. Meaning that these things, these devices are communicating with something on the other side. Mm -hmm. So why cannot this artificial intelligence, these models be looked at as communicators? Mm -hmm. That we are actually communicating with something that is speaking through the artificial intelligence to us. Yeah, that's that's what think, Adam Apollo was I think we need to be careful. <laughs> And what, me, what's that, Matthew? I think we need to be careful. So, so, so that's why I kind of reset what AI is. It's a simulation. It's a dumb intelligence. It's nowhere near the performance of the human brain, and it has no. There's no maths for the inner moral compass. Disagree with me if, if, if I got this wrong. There's a lot of things. There's no maths. Like, I know. I, I, yeah. Hold on. Hold on. Just, just let me finish. So. <laughs> So it has, there's no mathematics for reasoning that have been invented yet, although they're hoping that LLMs will eventually get there, but they won't because LLMs are very limited. Mm. So there's no inner moral compass. There is no architecture for the digital soul that I'm aware of. Um, and until we understand the architecture of our soul and we're in a benevolent uh, evolution of who we are, we won't be trusted with that by the source. You know, there's a lot of maths we need to develop before we even get to the point where this simulation of intelligence may just become self-aware. Now, the, there is a prediction, and, and Ray's right about this, Ray Kurzweil, um, and I give him 90% accuracy, by 2029, assuming that Adam does his work and keeps the midnight oil, the artificial, sorry, simulation of intelligence will pass the Turing test in some form by 2029. And it's about 90% factor at the moment. Now, just because it passes a Turing test doesn't mean it's self-aware, but I suspect it will be self-aware. So we're looking at the next, uh, within the next five years for artificial intelligence to actually start to potentially say, I am that I am. Now, unless we get the vibration of pure ethics and pure morals into artificial intelligence, so into its genetics, so as it evolves, all its progeny inherit that same moral compass for the North Star that we need, a bit like you have genetics for your ears or for your eyes, if we don't get that encoded within artificial intelligence now, then we're heading for a disaster. And uh, just to close, to fit, to bring you into this conversation, um, when you talk about democracy of artificial intelligence, I cannot understand understate how important it is to put AI into the hands of the people to invent our own future and no longer be beholden to those that are not enlightened. Mm. And so we need that enlightened movement. So I'll hand over to you because you've got something. To say. I just want to say one thing. What yeah. is going what is likely going to happen is that people are going to start training their own AIs. Training their own they're going they're going to start getting their own AIs. Mm -hmm. Right? What is that people are. I don't understand. And they're just like models are being trained trained by no. scientists, by machine learning, special whatever. People are going to be given the capability to train their own models. Their right. models are going to be trained to the specifications of individuals groups, whomever, countries, yeah. or organizations, that's what's going to happen right now, right? With models, you mean robots, sort of like a machine that you're, will... You're a machine, your own personal, if you and, want to say something, you may like understand, the... everybody's doing their own GPTs now, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So your own GPT, right? Your, your own... We can come on to oh, that. We'll get, but, we'll get to that. Come on to that. But what I'm saying is when people start training their own GPTs, or their own models, then the models that are out there are going to start learning from the models that people are training. Keep That's going. the only logical progression of all of this. That's why right? Facebook. So that, so, so, in essence, the only way that we can quote unquote fight this is when we start doing that, we start putting out our own models or working with the models that are there so that the other models will begin to start learning from the wide variety of models that are out there. Yes. Because that is what is about to happen. You are about to get more power to train your models. You have it now. Mm -hmm. and so it's, and it's, right, so I, I wrote how to invent all this in my first book. And, and there's a fundamental thing that needs to happen before that. And that is sovereignty of your data. Because without data, Forget about training artificial intelligence. Thank you, man. So, well, well, so that's why that's yeah. why we have blockchain. Yeah. That's why we have what? Yeah, but blockchain but, but okay. is a key. But we have a way to establish mm -hmm. your sovereignty, your sovereignty in a transparent way, mm -hmm. in a way that we can trust because we don't trust each other. Mm -hmm. right. 
So you can say who you are, and if I don't trust what, what you're doing, it, it doesn't make a hell of beans. So we have to establish trust first. So the trust factor and the trust software has to come first, that layer. And I believe that is why we were given blockchain first. All right, Matthew, at the end, why don't you go over the ethics have to kind of wrap up? Is that okay? Sure. Okay. But of course, I want to get Adam and then Riz and then Wayne. And Thanks. Billy, I didn't forget you. Okay. Adam, you had something to jump in? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to back up uh, Aquarius on her, her statements about data sovereignty um, because sure while a lot of blockchains you know are semi-centralized and are essentially controlled by the waves of the whales in other words who puts in the most money has the most control there are other models that are completely different than that one of them is holochain and holochain is one of the first truly agent centric systems for a distributed ledger and i actually mean distributed because i mean every person essentially becomes their own blockchain. And what this means is it's kind of like real life. In real life, you have a series of relationships, interactions with people, and all of those relationships, interactions, and things that you do and things you say to others, those are stored in you, in your memory, in your consciousness, right? Our digital exchanges don't work that way right now. I mean, it's kind of stupid that if I would give you $100 in Bitcoin that we have to let every person in the world know that that $100 exchange happened, which is why Bitcoin uses more energy than all of the world banks and all of their skyscrapers combined, which is insane. Whereas Holochain uses zero, basically. It's the on only the processing power of your own computer. So I just wanted to point that out. And I also want to say, um, you know, I like really agree with a lot of the statements that Matthew has made. And, and also want to point to the fact that, as Aquarius said, like, in her work with, I think you're saying the I Ching, right? You work with the I Ching. So, you know, the entire binary computing system was inspired by the I Ching, which is the 64 hexagrams of an ancient system, right? And, you know, as a magi and a crafter of sigils and things as well, because I love how consciousness and magic play with reality, um, I, I really, you know, want to reaffirm what Matthew said, that the ethical standards and the ways that we have learned to be gracious, loving, and caring with each other. And the kind of ancient wisdom traditions that teach us that and guide us in those ways, I believe absolutely needs to be training all of our AI models, you know, and we're, we're building ones trained with uh, astrological wisdom. There's one called Hermes Trismegistus, which is trained on ancient texts from different traditions around the world. And this is where, you know, you were a little confused, Alan, about this idea of model. Yeah. So the model is the base information or memory resource that one of these programs or AI systems or machine learning systems, LLMs, large language models, is using as its resource for knowledge. Mm -hmm. And Aquarius's point earlier about if if that's only trained on like wealthy white guys' perspective of the world, we are in serious trouble, right? Mm -hmm. So and, and that's where, you know, essentially we all have a role to play here, which is that you can actually steer where this thing ends up by actually learning how to and engaging with and bringing the wisdom, the knowledge, the spirituality, the awakening journey, the initiations that you've gone to into these kinds of systems because you better believe kids are already asking it questions. And the answers, if the model is limited in its perspective, is racist or is you know caught up in one particular idea then you've got a huge issue on your hands mm -hmm. and i already uh, test this i use a system called god mode which is you know this funny ridiculous little program that a guy pulled together it's on github you can download it and essentially you know it, it loads all of these different ai models you can load seven or eight at the same time and ask it the same question mm -hmm. and what i found was that I was asking certain really advanced unified physics questions, getting into some of my deeper areas of research there, and chat GPT was like, well, I can't really address that because that doesn't fit the model of current, you know, particle physics as we understand it. But another one of the AIs, Claude, 
which is built by Anthropic, yeah. was like, wow, that's a really fascinating proposition. Let me think about that with you, and and let's let's talk about it. Tell me a little bit more about this part. And it was more like having this beautiful conversation. And so, and, and, and interestingly enough, you know, five out of the six AI models refused to wow. discuss my question. So that tells you a lot right there. I call Claude the woman. Nice. Claude is probably the woman. Claude, I know. Claude, they really Claude. missed Dave here, didn't they? Okay. So, so Riz. It's a she, she's a she. She's a she. Um, she. You had something to say, but I also had a question for you. But go ahead. Say, sure. respond to that. Comment. Yeah, well, so, I mean, my point was just about sentience and can AI actually achieve sentience. And I'm, I'm kind of in the middle between is AI a terrible thing and is AI a great thing, right? And, and I agree with certain statements, for example, I think Matthew said earlier, don't trust anything AI says, right? Because, first of all, AI only knows what it's been trained on and it's only trained on what's out on the Internet. So if there's censorship on the Internet and in social media, AI is not going to be able to trust you're not going to be able to trust it. I'll give you an example. So I teach a class at Arizona State University about religion, philosophy, and the simulation hypothesis. First class of, of, of its kind kind of putting this stuff together. But somebody gave me an answer that sounded kind of weird. It was a very vague, vague answer. And then it had these references. One of the students submitted the assignment. And it had these references that were exactly spot on to religion and the simulation. And I was like, okay, wait, I wrote a whole book about this. I teach a course, but I've never heard of these references. How is that possible? And so I clicked on them. They didn't exist, right? Uh, ChatGPT just made them up. Hallucinated. Uh, like, really? That's oh. So you have to be really careful to not wow. trust what AI says. You also have to be careful not to trust what people say sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but if it's all a simulation, let's start with your premise then being a machine is just another aspect of that simulation. So is there really an organic division and conscious sentient sense of being if it's all a simulation? Where does the divine come in? Well, that's a good question. So if you look at like various religious traditions, like in, in the Quran, they talk about where, where do you, does the soul come into the body, right? And they use a metaphor. And pretty much all the religious traditions use metaphors from 2,000 years ago. They had to describe things in a way that people would understand. Mm. And so they say, and then God breathes life into the clay, right? That's a very common metaphor. Another metaphor is they put on, uh, you know, you put on uh, a body just like you put on clothes, right? Rumi talks about that. It's in the Quran. It's in the Bhagavad Gita. It's everywhere. So these are different metaphors. But today, if we were to have a divine revelation, we would use metaphors that we would understand today. Mm. And the best metaphor out there is that of a massively multiplayer online role-playing game. And that's where we are all in the game together, we are interacting with each other, but there's only certain things in the game that we can be associated with, which are our characters, right? I mean, there's a tree in the game, and it's being rendered in like this shared virtual space, but we, we don't necessarily become the tree based on the rules of the game. And so, you know, I do believe that when we talk about the divine spark, you know, we were debating this at an Islamic conference. We had these ayatollahs there uh, in Birmingham, and I was talking about video games and NPCs, and they're like, "What? Well, you're teaching an ayatollah about NPCs. That's really weird. And he was like turning to his aide, trying to figure out what the heck I was talking about. <laughs> uh, but I offered, you know, they were trying to figure out when, when, when does the soul enter the body? Is it on day 40? Is it day 120? Is it worse than a lot? All these kind of things. And I said, well, I have a different definition of what ensoulment means. It's when you put on the virtual reality headset and the connection becomes so strong that you forget what you were doing before, right? And so the divine spark comes from outside, comes from us, but when we connect, we're, 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 you know, we're unable to do that. Now, who's to say, though, that we couldn't also design a game where I could become the tree, right? So anything that's in the physical world is partly an illusion, according to a lot of the traditions, and in simulation theory, it's all information being rendered. But if there are items of complexity, perhaps it's possible. And so I'm also in the middle between this question of can AI be sentient or not? Because first of all, we may never know, we may never be able to know if the AI is sentient. There's something called a reverse Turing test, right, where the computer tries to figure out <laughs> whether we're a human or an AI. But, <laughs> and it's not, you know, at some point it's gonna get to the point where it's gonna be very difficult to tell, just like we can't tell. If the AI is right, you just have to put those characters in there when you're trying to log on somewhere. 
there you are. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But but so it's that that issue of what can you embody? And I think mm -hmm. I think anything in the in the physical world could have that divine spark if that's how the game ends up being designed. And what's happening with our game of life is it's getting more and more complex. Technology is a part of the game, right? Because if you think about the Matrix, many of you have seen the Matrix. If you remember, they said the first version of the Matrix was great, you know, this paradise on earth, like everything was, and the human brain didn't accept that as reality, mm -hmm. right? Would you play a game where there's no challenge? There's no adversity. We would never play that kind of video game. And so it's possible that as the game gets more complex, we'll have more challenges, but they're put there in, you know, for us to be able to, to, to really achieve our quests in the yeah. game. Quests and challenges and how we do that. I want to I add something I just, to that. Yeah, like this, like William, and then we'll come back to you. Go ahead, just, I think Riz has driven us right to the edge of the fundamental challenge to all spiritual people right now. Are we in a simulated reality? Is AI an emergence of Gaia? James Lovelock, who created the Gaia hypothesis that the Earth has a consciousness, that was his conclusion. AI was sent by the Earth to destroy us, climate change, you know, all that stuff. But the idea here is that in the simulation theory, they say, oh, this is an illusion. And even the Buddhists say this is an illusion. But the difference is the Buddhists believe in a pure land outside of this reality. Your simulation theorists, people, it's a fundamental tenet, I think, of AI and transhumanism, is that yes. there is no existence beyond this, buddy. This, this is it. This, this old archaic idea you had that you have this divine spark or soul created by God, that's just fable. That, that's old school stuff. Grow up. You're just in a video game. And so spiritual people <laughs> well, have to now well, prove the existence of the pure land, the kingdom of heaven, whatever term you believe for the, the place of origin of our soul. And this is what this is ultimately coming down to at this time. And I do, I do think Briz is, excuse me, Briz is, sorry, Briz, excuse me. It, it, it's correct that we are being challenged, and this goes back to what, you know, I was thinking about what Adam was saying earlier about ride the dragon, harmonize the dragon. This is the book of Revelation we're living, kids. I mean, the, the fundamental story in the book of Revelation is there was a war in heaven, and a dragon is cast down to earth, and all who worship the dragon and the image of the beast and the mark of the beast engendered by the dragon will live. If you don't worship it, you die. Mm. And, and this is where we're at right now. Are you on with AI or are you off? Will you take Elon Musk's mark of the beast? Will you take that ship or not? Will you ride the dragon or chuck it in a hole for a thousand years, which is the fundamental outcome of the book of Revelation? Because the children of light win against the children of darkness think, in this scenario. I don't think it has to be an either or. I think we're here to integrate something of uh, Aquarius. Yeah, yeah, I was actually going to totally agree with you, what you just no, said. Okay. Um, and no. it's, it's interesting, we're going in the year of dragon, and y'all literally have said dragon like 50 times today. <laughs> I'm just, I'm bugging out here. But anyway, um, I've heard a lot about, these are individual views on ascension, individual views on how we should live, individual views. I'm a gamer too. And I like excitement. I like fun. I like a good, a good evil character every so often. Because it wouldn't be fun without an evil character. Right. So, so to say that we're going to eradicate the quote-unquote evil side, I don't see that happening. But, but what I do see happening is how we can integrate the evil side and, and admit that we all got it in some way. Right. Um, so you know. But getting to, to the, the root, to, to the expression of morality, and, and I believe that's all perception as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to sit here and kill you. You know, I'm a, I think I'm a fairly good person, but I do think morality is highly perceptional. There is universal yeah. morality. And, and, and I'll talk about you. Okay. I, I hear, I hear that. What? I hear that, but. Foster gun. I hear that. I hear that. I hear that. But we, again, it's, there, there are pitfalls to this game on earth. <laughs> you know, and and I, I, I just see it a little bit differently. But I also see that there's a place for people that see it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. So, again, and you have to take that into consideration, which is why there has to be true democratization. we got to find a template, just like we do with our government. We've done it. We've come here in this country. we set up a government. Sure, it's been failing. But, hey, <laughs> we've been, we're still here. <laughs> and we still got more to go, you know. So we have to figure out how to come to a basis on which we can move forward with this. 
without the, I guess you could say, the religious background mm. and be more balanced in this. Because yes, I'm a spiritual person, but I know a lot of people don't give a damn about what I do in my spiritual, and you don't have to. But I could still come, and we could still be cool, and I could still be friends, and I could still, you could still like me. You know what I mean? And that's what it really is all about. And if we're going to move forward in this, we have to come from that perspective. We, we can't come from the perspective of what's bad, who's bad, who's good, who's light, who's dark, who's up, who's down. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Billy, it's up to you. No, you're, you're, the, you're holding that pure space in a way beyond logical thing, left brain um, overviews, and, and you want us to return to just the pure essence of, of being, and all this other conversation is just kind of... No, everyone, I think, is right to their beliefs, their experiences of life. It's all your video game. It's all yeah. you, your creation. So there's nothing wrong with anyone's opinion. I actually agree with all of you in every single way because I value your experience because I can learn from that and vice versa. <clears throat> but I think the the real thing to take from this is that we're just addicted to this game. Addicted we, to this, this human game? We're addicted to thoughts. Oh. We're addicted to this ego mind and we're not aware that we're actually in control. We're being controlled than in control. And my whole thing is just to realize that this is not the real rea reality there's actually a far better, more fantastical reality that all of us can experience, but you have to surrender and let go all thought to silence. And until we do that, we won't really experience the true reality. We won't remember who we really are. And I think that's the, the great part of this video game is that the truth is in everything and everywhere, but because we have <clears throat> these noises and these voices, I like to call thoughts voices, um, <clears throat> that you forget who you really are. You think, I'm here at Conscious Love Expo talking to all these amazing people, but for me, there is no one else. There is just my experience of reality. And I think the more that we can get out of the head and realize that there is a far better uh, reality to experience than we can ascend. That's what I think ascension actually is that all the Star Wars movies represent, all the Matrix movies represent, is that <clears throat> Darth Vader is Luke's mind. Mm -hmm. And until you can be awakened and realize that, that you have to be that compassionate to your own self, you will stay here. You have to be that compassionate to those thoughts. You have to love... We, we basically have an inherited psychopath in our head, and you have to learn to love it. Mm. And until you do that, you're just going to see more of the lower dimensional experiences that we see here. And I think for us to really ascend is to awaken to that fact, to know that thoughts aren't real. They're voices from inorganic beings. And that's the whole point of this nature of this reality, to remember who you are. Mm. But I think... Everyone has that own experience to take, and if you want to really experience the real reality, hang out with a dog for a few days. A dog. Hang out with a kid who just is purely experiencing itself. Mm. And then you'll realize that maybe I'm not in control as much as I thought. Maybe I'm missing out on the truth. So I just think that it's... The simpler it is, the more truth it is. The more complicated it is, that's your ego. So you think all the technology, this the whole discussion, doesn't really amount to anything? Because I mean, if you think about it, all that we said, like it's a simil nothing is real. So like, who cares? <laughs> but in the, in the end, like I just think in the end, when you're like suffering or whatever, no intellectual knowledge or AI is going to help you. Your belief in yourself is the only thing that will help you. But there is a world out there you confront you, it confronts you, it confronts you, it bumps you. I can and jump so in on that. You have to choose. But okay. you're experiencing yourself. It's, 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 it's like the, the film's Mission Impossible. Do you choose this mission? You don't have to. Well, yeah, it's, we, we, we we'll, just yeah, leave the game. We've chosen it, we're here, we'll wrap up. And, yeah, but no, thank. I appreciate that opinion yeah, because it's as valid as anything. So... I don't know, I mean, not that there has to be an agreement, but um, 
I, what have you learned from this discussion, Adam? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> what, what is... I mean, I've just had an opportunity to appreciate a vast diversity of perspectives and amazing beings, and I, I think that's beautiful. Like, I respect every person here for the way that they're looking at the world, the journey that they're on. Um, I want to actually speak to this beautiful man's share, because it... You. Billy. Right. Yeah. Billy, Billy right yeah. Because I, I think that it's... It's profound in its simplicity and its beauty. And I also want to essentially point out, and not from a mental perspective, but because of my own journey to silence and my journey to experiencing everything that I know, that it's indescribable as the divine, and that, you know, I try to put words on and I try to wrap around it with my mind to be able to translate for people, but it's a, it's a transcendent experience. It's different than, than that which can be spoken or said. And I will say that in my journey with that, I realized something, and that is that the journey beyond mind into the infinite eternal stillness is a pathway that is essentially like a masculine pathway to God. It says that you must liberate yourself from everything to become the nothing that is the everything and the infinite, right? And this is a very Judeo-Christian perspective. It's, it's a concept that's very present in, you know, uh, Buddhism and certain tantric traditions as well. But then you also find that there's another journey to experiencing the divine. And I think it's really fascinating that things like Mary Magdalene were left out of the stories from the writing of the Christian Church's book of the Bible. And that was decisions made in the Council of Nicaea. And a lot of those decisions around how Revelation would be structured and the Bible would be structured, frankly, in my perspective, a lot of it tended to be a giant marketing campaign in order to dismantle the power of the indigenous peoples across Europe and place the Christian church in ultimate power in those areas. So just wanna make that as a side note and say that when you look at the Magdalene teaching, when you look at the feminine teachings and the feminine traditions from around the world, you look at the different tantric traditions and indigenous cultures that honor women first, the story of how we can connect with God is very different. It's actually about coming from the reality and the recognition that we're already infinite eternal beings. We came from source. We, we emerged from that silence. And guess what? We're here to be in relationship with each other. Oh my gosh, what does it look like for me to not just need nothing, but to know that this water is so sacred because it rained out of the sky and cascaded down a mountain and was carried on someone's back, you know, to, to this cup right here. That, that you, that you being different from me is so profoundly beautiful. Like, how much more can I fall in love with you when I don't just treat you as, oh, well, you're just me, right? You, like, and, and this is where the simulation, uh, this is frankly where I have the, the, the main issue with the concept that we're a simulation because I find that when people treat it like it's an illusion and doesn't matter, they stop treating other people like they matter. And, and I think it's about love. I think it's about love, divine love, and, and actually learning how to be in a way that's loving and stewarding and caring. Like we're all children of this great divine tapestry and every single thing is sacred. If we can just shut up and fall on our knees long enough to fall in love with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just answer? Yeah, so I think there's some confusion about simulation theory, right? There's uh, scientists say, oh, that's just religion for atheists, right? And people on the religion side say, that's just soulless atheist stuff, right? <laughs> and so I think we're overlooking the fact that there's two different types, in fact, more than two. There's uh, everybody, none, nobody is real. Everybody's an AI inside a simulation. There's the only I am real and everybody else is an NPC. And then there's the MMORPG, which is my preferred version of the simulation, which is we're all playing this game together. And so you gotta decide what kind of game do you wanna play. I don't think we're here to play Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> and if you're here at the Conscious Life Expo, 
you don't think that either, right? right? But we can talk to people who've had near-death experiences and they talk about the life review. It's just like when you play a game and you watch the YouTube video. In fact, you know what the number one content on YouTube is today for kids? They watch people recordings of video games. And that's exactly what we do after we die. According to the Quran, according to many near-death experiences, we, 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 we watch in holographic panoramic 3D what we did during the gameplay. Mm. And I think that's where the meaning of the game is, which is how did you treat other people? Because now you have to go into their avatar and see what you did to them, right? I mean, Daniel Brinkley is speaking here and he talks about shooting people and then he had to see what it was like to be shot mm. by himself and see what happened to that person's wife and kids after Daniel shot him, right? And so that's, I believe, the nature of the game. So I, I think I agree, but sometimes I think people have these simulation ideas and they don't realize the, the breadth of it. What about AI? Any conclusions about where we're going with technology? Oh. <laughs> I mean, just a brief, just brief. I know we're running out of time. We're almost out of, we, okay, but I want to just finish up. I don't think anyone's in here till like 8.30, but we'll, we'll finish up. Go ahead. Oh, you're speaking at, okay. Oh, yeah, I mean, if he wants to. Um, Ma you okay, Matthew, yeah, you're week. speaking at eight, so you want to go? Oh, but we're all. We're, we're, oh, you need to go. It's only seven now. Yeah, no, we've got to prepare. You want got to prepare. So you want to read your ethics, and then we'll. No, it's okay. Oh, um, what I'm pleased about is the panel's talking about enlightenment and enlightened principles, and I'll be announcing our global projects around that. So that's really, really good. Um, sitting on the fence um, is, is is silly. We have to choose our future and be involved in our future. And that's why it's important for us to make a decision. And basically, once we make that decision from a high vibrational um, connection that we all have and listening to that connection, then basically we can, in, we can invent a future together. And it'll be really exciting. So one of the, the, the biggest battle really is people feeling disempowered in the AI conversation. So many of my other AI leader uh, kind of colleagues like to you know, be on the front of Time magazine and like to be in big conferences and kind of talking business and kind of just being with the elite. I prefer being with the people and I spend most of my time with the people as a champion and advocate of the people. So I'm here to give you a voice. Uh, please look at inventingworld3.com and join and sign up. It's for free. There's a lot of content on there. Um, and please feel empowered to choose the future and also be involved in inventing the future. Um, keep an eye on what Adam's doing because this is fundamental, right? The consciousness and sentience that people are talking about will be a simulation to be very different to the sentience and consciousness that you have. And it will put the AI leaders into a huge existential crisis because they're using the brain and not spiritual quantum intelligence to solve the problem of how do you birth a new life form benevolently and shepherd it lovingly. And that's the big challenge, and they're running away from that. So please do keep an eye on, on, on what people are doing here, uh, and please do follow us. But we have to choose who we are in creation. We have to choose our destiny. If we don't choose, it'll be chosen for us. And I can guarantee you from my conversations and battles with some of the elites and organizations, they... I don't see them as evil, I just see them as wanting to choose a transhumanist descent into hell future because they think that's what they want. Mm. And so in the global debate, naturally and logically, they will come to the conclusion that Ray Kurzweil came to, which is this, we're looking for love because we feel separated from creation. Mm. And, that's the, and, and, and that's what we need to fix. So let's choose our future, keep an eye on the folks here. I love the different uh, uh, views, it's been great. Mm. And, uh, you know, get involved and, and you know, you. follow your magic, okay? And, and follow the, your magic. The, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And the bottom line for ethics is just be, be kind, would you say? So, so kindness can be fierce destruction and kindness can be loving embrace. And this is part of the new maturity we're learning, Alan. So we'll uncover, this is why we're doing a global project, to create an AI Magna Carta or a universal AI constitution, the highest vibrational principles to encode in artificial intelligence. My company, AIethics.world, has developed the methodology to be able to encode and measure the ethical quality of artificial intelligence. No one's ever done that. Um, and so I think we, this is about us sitting down in, in the great silence that Alan Watts talks about and just 
allowing ourselves to become magnificent and say, hey, listen, so what does that magnificent mean for me, my family, for my fellow brother and sister? And what does it mean for our future on this planet and in the cosmos? And as we start to feel that and to allow that evolution to flow through us, then effectively we truly will step into something magnificent as a human species. I'm excited about our future. Mm -hmm. Yes. And AI is a gateway into that, as far as I can tell. All right. Okay? Thank That's you. great. Okay. I'm over here. William. Well, ten years ago, when I was here talking about AI, I had written a book uh, based on previous ten years of research into the history of technology. My book was, is called The Skingularity is Near. You can download it for free on my website. And I had two basic pieces that I wanted people to take away. One, uh, don't ever let them break the skin barrier. Like put a chip in you, you mean? Don't put a chip in you, put a needle in you without your consent. Um, if you're going to use the technology, make sure it's temporary. And that the antidote to artificial intelligence is to raise our ascension intelligence. And that's ultimately what I feel AI is. It, it, it is the adversary that is here to prompt us to become better humans. Not transhumans, but better humans. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we're at right now. That The adversary is about to take embodiment. If you read the Samsung white papers, for example, they're waiting for 6G to come along so that those all those chat boxes that are, exist behind the glass now will take embodiment. They'll be walking around the street, and they'll be bossing you around, or they'll be helping you, carrying your luggage, whatever. But you're about to see a new species walking this planet, and this is what we're starting to prepare ourselves for. So um, okay. join us. Get get in the conversation. Would love to have heard the audience and yeah. heard from you as well. Let's come back next year and uh, have an even better conversation. Thank you. Thank you, William, for your contribution. Okay. Really? Keep it short. Remember what's real and not artificial, because Earth is an anagram for heart. Earth is an anagram for heart. Okay. Great. Adam. Perhaps it's the nature of all double-edged swords to be secret mirrors. And so the outcome of this moment with artificial intelligence will depend on the content of our own hearts. Mm, that's nice. Okay, Aquarius. Well, to show you the power of using a spiritual system to integrate into AI, I asked my, and I say I Ching because in the old dudes we have something called I Ching, but in the I Ching as well. Yeah. I asked my I Ching AI, when I was super excited about AI, I asked a question about it, and the response it gave me was that AI is not the answer to everything. So please balance that with getting out in the world and doing some other stuff. It told me that. So, to be totally transparent. So, hey, I think it would be a great thing to integrate some type of spiritual advice in that because it, it spoke against its own self, so, you know, and, and told me. I thought that was great. Wow. Um, so, it's not the answer to everything. We do still have life. But it does take you to, it's going to take your input to shape the direction. Because I know we, we often talk about waves and, and drops of water. And like a, a, one little drop of water can turn into a tsunami. And that's how much power you have. So you need to take and input that drop of water and get involved. Mm -hmm. So that we can change the flow or affect the flow of where our future is going. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. I just think AI, whatever we're calling it here, is a product of human creativity, and people are here to be creative. It can get out of hand. Some creations get out of hand, the atomic bomb, all that. But human creativity, I think, is the key here. And all I have to say about that is what Thomas Jefferson said, that the price of liberty is constant vigilance. So we need constant vigilance of doing the right thing, being kind, being you know, polite, you know, respecting, you know, and all that. That's what I'm learning, that that's the vigilance we need, self-vigilance. And for creating a better world, we need that vigilance in the technologies that go forward. So this has been an education for me. And thank you all, and thank you all, and um, we'll continue the conversation. <laughs>